as our home. I'm just saying that you need to take care of the simple things because if you can't do the simple things, how are you going to save the environment? At the moment, it's the men who dominate the decision making. Earth Summit has locked out the fourth world peoples. In June 1992, the world met in Rio to discuss the fate of planet Earth. In this largest summit and very first Earth summit ever held, representatives from 166 countries, 130 heads of state, and 15,000 non-governmental organizations came together with the hopes of deciding specific agreements that would balance environmental preservation with economic needs. Everyone wonders what happened at Rio. Why did we hear so little about it? With 9,000 journalists, the largest gathering of international press the world has ever seen in one place, it is a wonder why more information was not disseminated. One reason was obvious. The majority of press stayed inside the fortress-like walls of UNSAID, the UN Conference on Environment and Development, and roamed around looking for tidbits of news. When a story seemed to be brewing, the hungry crowd of journalists grew frantic, like a pack of piranhas in a feeding frenzy, looking for sound bites and media clips. Yet the real news was taking place 30 miles away in an alternative conference called the Global Forum. Here were gathered the NGOs, or non-governmental organizations, who spoke with a strong voice about the real problems facing the planet. It was in this direction we chose to focus our cameras and glean the wisdom and truths of those who were, for the most part, locked out of the main conference. We now present the powerful insights we heard coming from the indigenous people, the women, and the youth. It is their perspectives on the root causes of our global malaise and their logical solutions for planetary healing that the world now needs to hear. The most in important thing that is going on in Rio is the fact that we are exerting our rights and that to be heard is an exercise on global democracy, but as well is a prise de conscience. Uh, that individuals can make a difference, that it is not only up to governments to make, to be the decision-making factor that will change the course of history, but it is individuals who can make those governments make those changes. It's the nations that cause the most damage that are doing the meetings on it, to the exclusion of the nations that still have tradition ceremonies and Mother Earth spirituality to guide them. The, uh ability of the world to solve these problems depends in large measure upon uh, drawing more people into the, the process and hearing what they have to say from their perspectives, which have too often been uh, neglected in the past. It's a lot of the problems that we're facing today that if we actually sensitized ourselves to, we'd be able to solve them. Well, we have on our hands a terminally ill planet. We don't act now, it will be total systems collapse. The time when you can just dominate women and earth, when it went hand in hand, is past. Everybody take hold of what was happening right now and move forward with it. The huge rift between us who are very rich, that's why we're in this tent, and those children who have no homes and not enough to eat and no one to love them. And that's the majority of the children actually in the world. Yeah, they may have parents. They don't have enough food. And it's because we maintain our standard of living. The only thing we have that is even close to getting us all united, and it comes by way again of the female. I'll put it to you like this. You can get these women, put them in a room, and because of the love of child, they throw away ego, pride, economics, differences, any differences they have, they throw them away and the child becomes the unifying factor. I believe in the environment, and I think it should be taken care of. We have, they are not only 
the first and the third worlds. We have the fourth world. The fourth worlds are the indigenous people and women and children, you know, are part sometimes of that fourth world. We are the minorities. You know, the, uh, we are the minorities who have no voice. And uh, even here, the, the ironic and the paradoxing is that a child yesterday protested because, and they cut off his voice, you know, at the onset uh, meeting in Rio Center. And then people who did that don't really understand that whatever effort we are making here, we are making it for the future generation. We are making it for the children. And if children don't have a voice, if children cannot express their concern, what are we doing? The, the, the problem was that uh, for the very first time you got uh, a group of people who are very, very critical of the Earth Summit. For the first time, you got a group of people are saying that the Earth Summit has failed, that it is a complete farce and that it will go down in history as a total scam. And, and that, you know, uh, it has failed because it is not addressing some of the major issues that we think are very important if we are to save the world. That is, it should include uh, issues like militarism, which has been totally ignored. It should include issues like toxic waste dumping. It should include issues like third world debt, issues like, you know, unequal trade, issues like overconsumption. All of those issues were not addressed. And we say this is bullshit. I mean, this conference is not going to save the world. And that they're sp spending so much money and time and effort to come here to Rio, and yet to, to them, it is business as usual. And that's why we are saying that. And for, you know, uh, for saying that, we got pulled out. We got, you know, we got detained. We got, uh, you know, uh, we, a lot of us who were given interviews to the media were all being pulled out. Uh, we are not allowed to really talk to the media in Rio Central. And that's why we got so angry that we had to sit down and not, you know, and let them drag us away. Official youth representative in fiery speech to the plenary session criticizes unsaid process. Message censored, freedom of speech denied. Feedback censored, breakdown of planetary nervous system. Officially elected international youth Angry, upset, irritated, hold press conference. Onset is a farce. UN security officers push in, forcefully take away the youth all under 25 years of age. Casualties, detention, stripped of official credentials, media sensation. Well, for me, it was, well, it was violent, but not in the sense that what's just been happening in my country. Because in the Philippines, it's really violent there. Any form of dissent will just be crushed. As in our rallies and demonstrations have been, uh, with, we've been dispersed with tear gas and everything. But here, it's, so it was a picnic to me, you know, being, being just dragged there. It was the first time that I got close to a police officer and not hit. But I felt so miserable afterwards because, you know, this is unsaid. This is supposed to be the UN thing. It's the last resort, you know. It's exactly the, those those values that we hold dear to our heart against militarism, which has not been addressed in my country, it has not been addressed here at all. And it, it was just frustrating for me. This conference was supposed to be addressing environment and development and making you know, public participation uh, the primary goal so that everybody could have their voice in addressing you know, the problem, the, the global crisis. But we see that it's been completely controlled by you know, the, the dominant government, uh, actual do dominant government and the multinational corporation, which now control the, the, the economic world. And so they don't want to make these changes because right now they have the power and they want to keep it and that's all, you know. And so uh, we see some things like uh, the, the whole um, unset process, the secretariat has been paid in large part, I think it's 30% uh, of its budget has been paid by, by multinational corporation that right now have a bad record in the, on the pollution. Uh, in, in terms of pollution. So it's a, it's a complete greenwash. They just pay to get their image improved. The whole trend we have seen here is the institutionalizing of the influence of the multinationals and the business community within the, UA, the United Nations system. The indigenous people, the youth and women have been only given you know, artificial representation of what's going on. And this is a very dangerous trend that we have to recognize and we have to work against. Those governments there in Rio Centro, they are not really representative of our, of our people, especially uh, among third world countries. Our governments there are the elite governments and they're not representative of the people. I think we have to recognize that the driving forces for any change are the people. 
It is not a concept, so-called sustainable development, developed at high ranks, you know, in offices by people wearing suits and ties. And it's not a concept to be developed by them and to be pushed down on the people. Those sort of concepts won't work. Any change has to be done by the people. The people are very conscious of the, about their environment. That's how they live. That's where they live. All these views that these young people here have expressed is, is a start, a new, a new way of thinking. They have respect for Indigenous people and, it, and I see a really positive future for Indigenous people in the world because they understand that Indigenous people like myself and my people have been marginalized and, and it's really glad to see, I'm really glad to see this. Almighty oh, Spirit. Great power, forgive us for not loving Mother Earth, but save it for the children. Throughout the world, the consumption ethic has spread. It's not a racial thing. It's not just black, it's not just yellow, it's not just red, it's not just white. It's a, it's a selfish genetic thing, it's a social genetic thing. It's, it's spread amongst the people where they believe now that we as, uh, as not only as an individual but as a social group have the right to consume and we have the right to ignore how much damage we're doing to the environment. We don't have to be responsible. And if we do, we'll just give you some paper money. You know, and here you can go and try to do something to clear up our mess. And so this consumption ethics is a horrible thing, and it's, it's what's leading us to ecocide. Well, our lifestyles have got to change. I mean, we, either we're, we're for a genuinely sustainable mode of living, a style of life, or that's just a fad. It's just a cheap endorsement, you know, for the moment. Either this is something you believe, and if you really believe it, then your life has got to echo it. You know, do you drive a car? What kind of stuff do you eat? How do you insulate your house? I mean, all of, all of those very practical decisions. What, what temperature do you keep your house at? You know, all of those things. How do you build? How do you travel? What do you teach your children? How do you, how do you, how, what, what is your religion really like? The United States is determining the fate of the earth. The US culture is a culture to emulate because it looks sexy, because we all emulate it ourselves, and because it's transmitted around the world by the transnationals. They transcend all borders and boundaries. If the US doesn't change, the Earth is doomed. Right now there's a split between North, the Northern developed countries and the Southern poor countries where the uh, dispute over the difference in economies and standards of living. We don't believe that as indigenous nations that the South can uh, uh, elevate themselves to the Northern standard of living because the Northern standard of living is a direct attack on the world. It's a form of co a consumption beyond belief. That this notion that the human beings are at the top of the heap and the rest of the creation is here for human consumption. I mean, that's the, the great religious traditions never said that. It's a kind of weaving of, of 
modern desires with texts that you, you can find almost anything in Holy Scripture to prove what you want first of all. Christianity is so selfish, and it's only human beings who are apparently able to do that. I don't know of many other species who accumulate things around them at the expense of others. I think all living things have their rights because um, they've been here as, almost as long as we have and because they can't talk doesn't mean that they don't have their rights. I mean, we shouldn't go down and cut, we should at least save some room for them because, I mean, we're taking up all these big spaces and just throwing them out of their homes. We shouldn't do that. The native religious tradition, their spiritual tradition, with respect to earth spirits, to the water, to the air, to the animals, to the insects, to the birds, I mean, all of that is a venerable tradition that mainline religious traditions have not entirely, but very substantially lost. And so one of the first critical things is an attitude of, of respect and genuine humility on the part of, shall we say, Western religious leaders who have a great deal to learn. I know that in the Northwest and tribes nationwide and probably throughout the whole Western Hemisphere that we have creation myths that makes the trees, the rocks, the air, the water, the animals and everything basically elder spiritual beings that transformed into their current physical manifestations. And then we came along and then we were transformed into who we are. But we're basically younger brothers and sisters of these other spiritual beings, and the great creator did this. And so we're all related. When indigenous people say my relations, they're not talking just human beings, they're talking about all of creation. We're all related. And a part of the, the problem is that the younger part of creation, human beings, is consuming everything and destroying the rest. We are cannibalizing our own brothers and sisters, and we're destroying what's left of them. We must give the indigenous people who are minorities in almost every country. We must rally and make sure that they have expanded opportunities for self-expression, for maintenance of the way of life they choose. When they choose their traditional ways of life, we must ena enable them to have the traditional homelands and the, and, and, uh, and the respect and the self-government they need to do that. So I hope that one of the results of this conference will be a whole new recognition of their value uh, uh, and uh, of their rights. In summary, Madam Chairman, we must better preserve our planet in order to nurture our children. We must better preserve our planet in order to nurture our children. And we must better nurture our children if we are to preserve our planet. Thank you. The nuclear waste and chemical waste and warfare has not been discussed at this conference. The greatest polluter of all things is what comes out of war. Indigenous people have the key. 
what we are trying to do now, I think, is to rediscover a sense of respect for our surroundings, for the other living things that share the planet with us. And there, who better to learn it from than the people who still belong to their land, who feel that the land for them is far more than just a commodity or a property, who look at the, at the land as the key to their culture, their history, their very meaning and identity is tied up in the land. And we have to rediscover that. You and I, as newcomers to where we live in the last 500 years, are like alien creatures who don't belong and don't really have that sense of respect. Indian belief is not any magic or secret. It's, it's in believing in Mother Earth to keep her healthy. And in return, she'll take care of us, and that's life, and that's to taking care of the sun. And if we don't do that, if we if Mother Earth can't operate, then then the radiation from the sun won't come in, and everybody goes. And that's what's happening in in Arctic up there. I'm from about 110 miles northeast of. Arctic Circle, the Guchen Nation are caribou people, porcupine caribou people, is now threatened by the oil and gas development. As Indian people, we can be very powerful to revive Mother Earth, but we need your help, and we need each other help. And it's most appropriate that we all have an opportunity to listen carefully to what indigenous peoples from all parts of the earth are telling us. <coughs> the Kayapo, as an example of what we can learn, understand the environment in which they live and classify ecosystems in ways which we would recognize in our language as extremely sophisticated. Global civilization is now encountering a major crisis, as we all know, and the philosophy of harmonious relationship to the environment is part of the solution. And we must learn some important lessons from you in order to establish that philosophy worldwide. The chief says that he does not want to fit in with society, he wants to stick with his native customs. He doesn't want to become white, he doesn't want to take part in the society, he wants to be Indian to the end. The chief said that in the olden days, people of his tribe, men, women and children, people used to live for 100 years, 120 years, nobody ever died of sickness. When the white man came, he brought disease and now uh, people die as young as a year old. Uh, the medicine that they now bring is not enough to make up for this uh, the situation. We come to listen and to learn. We know that eight out of ten of the medicines sold in America have a basis from the plants. We know one-fourth of our pharmaceuticals that we pay tremendous amount of money for in the store come from your knowledge and the knowledge of indigenous people around the world. The nuclear and the chemical warfare, the testing by the great multinational countries, that is being done in the Pacific. We have seen a genocide on the women of Belau, where they have had jelly babies. We have seen the effects of the radiation and the nuclear fallout in Australia and the Northern Territories. We have seen the fallout, what it has done in the dumping of the waste in the Pacific. 
You people who are the media here today have a responsibility to us, the Indigenous people, to make sure that the multi-transnational companies and the government and the World Bank who finances many of these projects of the transnational, multinational, do not continue with this desecration of life. Radioactive waste will produce epidemics like millions and millions of cases of cancer, leukaemia and babies born without brains for the rest of time. And in Kepley, or dwarfs, or mental retardation, 3,000 genetic diseases we know about. That's what nuclear power means. It's medically contraindicated and must be stopped. It's one of the major environmental hazards on the planet not addressed by the officials at this conference. I am from the Havasupai Nation. My people are located in the bottom of the Grand Canyon in Arizona. We have been fighting against two major uranium mine corporations for seven years, Energy Fuels Nuclear and Union Pacific. They have been trying to mine uranium on our main source of water. The reason why these major industrial corporations want to mine uranium is because of money. That's all they want. They want money and greed is their thoughts. They do not understand us why we want to live and continue surviving in our homeland. So I am filled with shame that we in the rich countries uh, continue to do the same thing, but then point to the poor countries and say, no, no, you mustn't do what we've already done. So I think there's a tremendous responsibility on us in Australia and Canada, the United States, to recognize what destructive eco-bandits we've been. The challenge does, does not lie with the leaders. The challenge lies with us as individuals in our own countries, in our own communities. So that what we have to do is be totally conscious of how we live all the time. We as individuals, wherever we come from, I think we have to start taking a stronger stand. Money is not the answer to all these struggling because just last year in the United States and uh, the whole energy package, we kind of defeated it because Arctic National Wildlife Refuge was part of it. Um, the one which, where we're trying to stop that gas and oil development. It was, they came on pretty strong after the Persian Gulf because they said they don't have any uh, uh, fuel, I mean, oil import anymore. So they were really, the pressure was really great. And we went and went and to the grassroots people and the grassroots people from their own living room, their own phone, Indian people across the nation held ceremony just before the voting taking place at DC. And uh, we did marching in DC. Just the grassroots people went out of their own way to just to to make it happen. We do have a power as a people and we come together and in all colors and uh, make this happen and we do have a power. And And I'm proud to say that because we had a consensus between North and South, which has been pretty hard for the men to do, they don't know how to get together North and South, frankly. They've had nothing but trouble. 
and trying to come to common agendas. We women, because of our outside power, our self-empowerment, our self-determination, realize that we have to come together from the North and the South and have a common agenda, a consensus agenda. We've used that agenda to get into the process of the UN. We've had caucuses at every preparatory committee meeting where we have gotten a recognition of the fact that unless women and their needs and their problems are dealt with by the UN summit, there will be no fundamental changes. I mean, how can the guys who created the problems, whether it's governments or businesses, uh, be the ones to change it? That's what they're wedded to. They're wedded to keep the status quo. Women from the outside are saying, we can't live under these conditions. You're destroying our lands. You're destroying our areas. You're polluting our lands. You're creating radioactivity. Militarism has knocked out our hopes for using money to build economic needs that women have. A major issue that I'm involved in is the Green Belt Movement, a grassroots environmental movement that is trying to rehabilitate the environment using very ordinary people, using very ordinary techniques so that they can work, uh, make money, uh, although it is little, uh, empower them, encourage them, give them a sense of worth, a sense of dignity, uh, so that they can also, as they restore themselves, uh, as they restore the planet, they can also be restored. And I think we have been very successful so far, those of you who have followed the movement. Uh, we have managed to plant more than 10 million trees. We have engaged more than 50,000 women. We have more than 1,500 tree nurseries managed by women. But perhaps the most, uh, perhaps the success of the Green Belt Movement is the fact that uh, we have raised a public opinion and a public consciousness in our country to a very high level. <laughs> Bill Riley, our own environment administrator, rose to the occasion, and he sent a message back to Washington that was endorsed by the State Department, asking the top administration officials to reconsider and see if they couldn't find a way uh, to sign the Biodiversity Treaty. And the Brazilian government offered to act as interlocutor to assist in bridging whatever gap exists. And the answer came back from Washington, from the White House aides, no, there are no changes that would be acceptable. And of course, they were speaking for the biogenetic industry, who weren't willing to share anything, who weren't willing to make any compromise. They wanted it all, and the Bush administration backed them up. America, which is based very much on spiritual principles of freedom and of accepting everybody, uh, is put in this position of of really rejecting everybody and uh, not being interested in sustainability, which is the planet, but only in terms of a very, very narrow margin of gains for a very, very narrow margin of people who are industrialists in the United States of America. And that's, that's tragic. I mean, short-term gains versus long-term uh, salvation of the planet. The discourse here and these magnificent people who are uh, telling us of their bleeding, of their pain, of, their, the, of the disruption of their lives, they are being heard. The world out there has a conscience, and that conscience is going to listen and it's going to react, and I think it's going to react positively. And I think that the United States will be in a pitiful minority as time goes on and as the conscience of the developed world uh, begins to take effect and begins to make demands on the developed world, especially on the United States. We will not be able to withstand the unified expression of disdain and, dis and distaste uh, and outrage at the negative, destructive position the United States has taken at this conference. Thank you. Thank you. One of the problems 
of the Biodiversity Treaty is that the Biodiversity Treaty wants to deal with the sustainable development and talks about the importance of the diversity of plants and animals, but it does not deal with the indigenous people. No paper of what they're doing over there is going to make any difference. Não é o papel que vai fazer uma diferença em relação a isso. It's like writing on sand. It can blow away. É como escrever na areia e o vento carrega. But if we talk about the real issue of cutting down of forests, trees, flooding, those are the issues that are going to touch people in order to help us. The United States is, has, a, has a history of violating treaties. People have to understand that the first treaties that the United States government ever signed was with the indigenous peoples that now live in, in that are in the United States and violated virtually every one. So the United States, whenever it does this, it, it always puts national security in front. And, uh, and it's that type of arrogance, that uh, policy that they perceive. They won't have to consult. They feel they don't have to consult with uh, the nation states of the world whom they are in partnership with, supposedly, for the care and the maintenance of the, of the earth. And if a tribe, for example, has been in the same area for 10,000 years, uh, they should not be uh, seen as having no rights to that territory simply because they don't have a legal uh, uh, deed of, uh, of title. Deeds of title are foreign to their tradition, and, and yet a commitment to, to, uh, to justice on our part would, would, would lead us to recognize that and, 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 uh, and acknowledge the rights that they have. As it is now, we know that the land, the water, the air, the ancient cedar forest, which is being totally uh, clear-cut right now as we speak, all that in the eyes of the um, American economy is up for grabs. They still believe it's manifest destiny. It's a free-for-all, that the resources are unlimited. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. So several of our elders are saying that three and four generations is not guaranteed anymore. We are near the end of history. So it behooves us to, to challenge uh, anything that is anti-natural and move toward natural law, natural view, getting back to, to less consumption, uh, less of an artificial uh, sustenance, and getting back to a spiritual sense of being, an internal balance, and caring for our relatives. to the world, don't we? I mean, we are. It says in Genesis that we were given dominion over the planet. Dominion over the planet to destroy it and all the other creatures that we live with and rape it and plunder it or dominion over the planet to care for it and be compassionate and nurture it. For if we were really intelligent, really intelligent, we would not be killing the planet and destroying our habitat. But there are huge untouched forests in Siberia, virgin forests. They'll be chopped down soon for paper. Well, we've got to have paper, don't we? The trees are the lungs of the planet. They absorb the carbon dioxide and they breathe out oxygen that replenishes the ozone. If we planted an area the size of the US with trees, we would use up all the CO2 produced since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So every tree is valuable. Every tree in the US is as valuable as every tree in Australia, as in the Amazon forest. And to concentrate solely on the Amazon and the tropical rainforest without concentrating on the forests on the Olympic Peninsula in Vancouver in Australia is obscene. The tree is an upside down lung. It's got a trunk, branches and 
leaves which breathe in carbon dioxide that we excrete and breathe out oxygen. Do you see what I mean? The trees are a physiological organ of the planet. <laughs> Youth is supposed to be uh, living longer here than anybody else because we're young. And if you look at UN statistics, over, uh, close to 50% of the global population are actually young people below the, below the age of 25, 50%. And yet they are not willing to listen to what we have to say. And what we are saying is that, look, you know, uh, if you're really, really serious about, you know, saving the world or really... Uh, serious about addressing our global crisis, that then you have to address some of the root causes of, uh, of uh, our global malaise. And, and that includes, like for instance, Ronnie mentioned, that militarism, because like um, UNSET actually estimated that uh, in order to implement the uh, plan of action that, that they signed today, the government signed today, uh, it would require about $125 billion. Uh, we're not going to get close to that. I think we will get about maybe $20 billion from uh, contribution from government. But the military is actually spending about $900 billion, you know, every year. Um, you know, uh, mil the military is the biggest polluter in the whole world. It is the biggest human rights abuser in the whole world. And it is the biggest, you know, squanderer of our resources, both, you know, material and human. And yet, there is not a single mention of the, uh, you know, about the military. We've been discussing militarism all day and women's rejection of militarism as a way of solving problems. And that we feel that in the 20th century, which has been the bloodiest century of all, that it's time that we reversed it. And the commitment should be to peaceful solutions and the resources that have been wasted and the destruction that has taken place must be given back to the women and the people of this earth. This conference is not addressing the military. The world spends one trillion dollars a year on weapons. If you spend a million dollars a minute since Jesus was born, you would have just now spent a trillion dollars. If we stop spending money on killing people, we have eight trillion dollars in eight years. Is that enough to provide solar cookers for all the people in India and Africa? Is that enough to reforest Africa and bring back the Sahara Desert to, for to forest again? The bottom line. It's love and respect for ourselves and love and respect for our surroundings, our earth, our nest. This is all we have and she can go on without us, but can we go on? And we're not killing the earth, we're killing ourselves and we need to come to realize that and have respect for it. And I truly believe that if we respect the earth and really take care of our surroundings, take care of our environment, um, then we will be taken care of. Some say expectations for this conference have been too high. They cannot be too high. Is it too much of an expectation to believe that saving the earth and making a, it a better place, a more hospitable place for present and future generations, is it unrealistic to think that that is a, 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 should be a goal? It's an achievable goal. We know that the only barrier is us. Only barrier is political will. The only barrier is the assertion of greedy, narrow self-interest. We can make this planet a better place. We must make it a better place. And if we don't make it a better place for everybody, it cannot be a better or a secure place for anybody. That message has got to get through. So now there are 5.46 billion of us. By the middle of next century, 14 billion. And the number now we have is already killing the Earth. So what do we do about it? The way we do it is to educate the women of the planet. Most women don't know where, what ovulation means. They don't know how they actually conceive, let alone do they have access to contraceptives, let alone do they have a decent standard of living, so they had 10 children because three might die. So we have to redistribute the wealth so people can eat, feed their children, give them antibiotics, immunisation, and so as they become educated, the birth rate automatically drops. It's everyone's right 
to have access to free contraception as it is to food. In order to solve this problem, we have to also do three things. We need to create the conditions that we know cause population growth to stabilize, and that means dealing with the causes of poverty. It means raising the levels of education and literacy, and it means respect for women and giving women uh, the ability to exercise power in society. The second thing we need to do is to speed up the development of new technologies that allow us to have a, a good standard of living without destroying the environment. We can provide solar cookers to India, solar houses throughout the world, windmills to generate electricity, big tanks to collect water from the rainwater, the rainwater falling on the roofs. In Australia, every house almost has a rainwater tank. The solutions to the problems of the planet are very simple. They're very low technology because then the transnationals will lose their influence and monopoly and we won't have to use what they produce, we can do it ourselves. And that's really the solution to the problems of the earth. But the, the final thing we have to do is to change our way of thinking and understand that not only are we a part of the natural world, we are all obligated to each other and connected to each other. In order to come up with a sensible plan to solve this problem, though, we must understand that the essential ingredient is, is hope. We're at the crossroads of time. And if you start complaining and saying it's hopeless or George Bush should or being a victim, you join the negative energy. If you say nothing will stop me, I'm going to step out and save the planet with joy, hope and courage, like Gandhi, like Jesus, or lots of women who ran the peace movement but were not acknowledged, then we'll do it. And I know we can do it. If you want to send a message to your community and also to the people of South America, plant a tree on behalf of the Amazon. Every time you plant a tree, make a statement that you're planting this on behalf of the Amazon. And environmentalists have got to set up an infrastructure that will allow native people, it doesn't matter whether it's Sarawak or Papua New Guinea or Brazil or Ecuador, we have to give the value for the forest products to the people who live in the forest and depend on that forest. And what I see is too much where a pittance is being offered to the people who live on the land to essentially rape the landscape, leave them with a few bucks and their land totally degraded. We need to have environmental groups uh, boycotting those products and, and those countries that are taking from the native people. And uh, we've got to offer or create a market for those societies. I just saw one in Papua New Guinea that are actually selectively harvesting products from the forest and they need an outlet where they can get uh, high dollar for their products. We've got to offer that to them. So I think it's up to anyone that cares who is willing to uh, put their dollars on the line. We've got to create those infrastructures for the native people. Purchase wisely. Find out which products to buy and which products not to buy. You know, from organizations like, from the, like Rainforest Action Network, for example, that's, a, that's something that, that people can do very simply. We came here to present a solution. If people look at the fact that the meat trade is the number one abuser of the environment in terms of uh, cutting down rainforests, in terms of water pollution, in terms of water depletion, and in terms of animal cruelty, we would see that as individuals, we can make a very big statement about healing the planet, not just by what we say, but by what we eat. The old ones say only the earth endures. The old ones speak truly, the old, old ones speak wisely. The question for us today is whether we will endure along with the earth. We all breathe the same air, so we all have to do it together. All four directions, all four colors for the whole four elements, air, clean air, clean water, clean land, and life. And what is the value of life? Life for us as Indigenous people is only a part of a time of an ongoing society. We have been there, we are here, and we are responsible to seeing that this earth remains for the future generations to come. 
Every human life is as precious and sacred as yours. And no one has the right to kill any human being for politics. But remember, women are the producers of life. Men sow the seeds. But if you destroy the earth, women cannot produce the ongoing life which is us here today for the future. Kia ora. In order to, to help heal the earth, we must heal mankind in order to, to heal the earth because we are connected to that natural world. We have to remember that we must love one another and support our children and keep our ceremonies and give our thanksgiving. We as youth commit ourselves to continue to work given that our, our leaders have failed to come to, you know, to find the uh, solutions to our global crisis. We cannot give up and we cannot escape. We must not look for escapes. And especially we must not look, uh, we must not look for escapes in drugs or in alcohol or in other, or in even in religion, uh, because we still have to face up to the realities. Uh, we are saying that uh, the world cannot go on the way it is. And those who are exploiting, those who are greedy, those who are rich, those who have actually uh, acquired or siphoned, I want to use that word, siphoned, those who have siphoned a lot of wealth from the poor communities uh, have a moral responsibility. And if they don't feel that they have a moral responsibility, eventually they will start eating themselves too because it's a matter of who goes next. The black people may go this time, the next time there will be another one lined up to be exploited and to be uh, plundered uh, if this trend goes on. Were we born to assist in the destruction of the creation which has taken billions of years? I scuba dive. The life in the sea is unbelievably beautiful and exotic with so many different fish. How did it ever happen? The life within a single cell, the human body, is absolutely miraculous the way it works. We are deciding the fate of the creation. Now, today. There is a groundswell around this world and best the nations pay attention to that. I mean, it was people power that took down the, the Berlin Wall. That was the nations that did that. The people stood up and said enough. People all over the world now feel themselves to be part of a single global civilization. Most of the world now agrees that freedom is a prerequisite for solving the global environmental crisis. The ecological crisis is fundamentally a spiritual crisis. It is a spiritual crisis because the crisis springs out of the relationship between human beings and the ecological system of the earth. We have been talking here about changing our values, changing our values. And I think one, one thing that the poor people must learn is that what is being projected there as the symbols of power, the symbols of wealth, the symbols of importance, the gold, the kind of cloth wear we wear, the kind of shoes we put on, the kind of cars we drive. Some of these are being put, projected to us so that we can go for them, so that we can become slaves of the system. But if we decided that we can do without the gold, we can do without the shoes, we can do without the cars, we can change our values, we can decide that there are more important things in life than the shoes, than the gold and the cars. And then we would begin to meet our basic needs but whether it is in the inner cities of the Americas or in Africa, we are looking for the wealth that we see in the rich communities. And that is why we have become enslaved. We are slaves of the values that we have accepted.
we can choose to say, I don't want it. Whether believer or non believer, whether belief is religion or that religion, it doesn't matter. It's so long. It's the inside ourselves, peace of mind, based on compassion. That's the best This is the most important conference you've ever been to, and nothing else in your life matters. And every morning you get up and look at your soul in the mirror, you say, did I yesterday do everything I could to save the earth? There are a lot of things to do, and you each have a different thing to do, because each of your souls is different and incredibly beautiful with infinite wisdom like nobody else's. Don't ask anyone else what to do. Stay with your grief and your pain, go through it, and through that, you'll know what to do. It's terribly exciting. This is a, uh, an immense uh, outpouring of the spirit here, and the spirit always comes where it comes. And if you try and predict where it's going to come, then you're in deep trouble. And if, if you have ears to hear, then the voices are very loud and strong and clear. And, uh, and so I think people of all faiths would be overjoyed by what's happening here, because the, the spirit is very, very visible and very audible. Sunshine. 